Arts, Performing Arts Center, um, some funding to construct a new soccer specific stadium on Church Street. There's also been discussions about funding for the Central Florida Sports Commission. So today we're going to have an overview of all of that from the groups that are involved in that. Um, just to quickly update you on the process, city and county staff are working together to develop an amendment to the 2007 Community Venues Interlocal Agreement. When that is finalized, um, the main main change will be to add soccer as a use or soccer stadium as a use for the TDT and then to increase the amount of TDT, TDT that is available for use by the um, Performing Arts Center and by the Citrus Bowl. When that occurs, there will be a vote at the city and the county on the amendment to the interlocal agreement and then we'll develop an MOU with Orlando City Soccer so that they can go forward to the league for the award of a franchise and the MOU will um, contain things like the team will be responsible for cost overruns, they'll have to sign a long-term deal with us and they'll also have to be awarded a franchise. So very similar to uh, the arrangement that we had with the Magic in terms of them being the developer. We're going to hear from each of the uh, groups. So the order will be the Dr. Phillips Performing Arts Center first, Florida Citrus Bowl, then Orlando City Soccer, and then finally Central Florida Sports Commission. So Kathy, you're up. Uh, yeah, I think so. Commissioner Stewart asked about questions and whether to hold them to the end so we can get through everybody's presentations unless it's a burning question that needs to be answered right then. Why don't we hold all the questions to the end and we can just bring them up individually. Good morning, Mayor and uh, Council members. I'm happy to uh, actually be standing here giving a presentation on the, pro on the Art Center, but most importantly, you can look out the window and actually see great progress. Just this past week, we lifted the very last canopy piece up on the first portion of the Art Center, which is quite a milestone for the project. Um, let's see, Rach. There we go. There we go. Okay. So as you know, we started the journey oh, in 19, uh, well, for in 1980s actually, and then in 2003 we actually began this effort for the art center, and we started it always uh, knowing what is the content and what is the purpose of the institution, and we're very fortunate in Central Florida to uh, have a very very strong workforce here in terms of uh, arts. We're the third largest in the nation. And so we have a great deal to celebrate, and that's one of the mission points that we have. How do we celebrate and create a place for all the organizations in Central Florida to actually grow and experience um, wonderful audiences and a wonderful facility? In addition to that, art centers uh, like this are places for education. And uh, I'll take you through that in terms of the facility, as well as participation. How do you encourage uh, audience members to participate in other types of uh, performing arts and how do you make a place quite friendly so they're actually invited to do so. And then great cities are not only built by philanthropy and leadership like you, but they're built by people who actually come to your downtown. And this venue can provide a place where we can all come downtown. Our mission basically is arts for every life. So how do you create a place like an art center that has over the past since the 60s have become quite elite and just in its presence and really uh, be something that's quite open to uh, really encourage everyone to have an experience in the performing arts. Um, we, are, as you know, we did not do this in a vacuum. This is the video. We're going to show you the video right up front, uh, so you can actually come inside the uh, come inside the art center from a technology perspective to see where we are today. But I also do invite you across the street to do a hard hat tour. A little techn technical difficulties here.
This is the video without volume. I think you'll get the idea um, of just the, uh, the presence of the space. This is the grand lobby. This is a grand staircase. What you're seeing right now um, down this perspective is actually stage two. The lobby spaces actually have been built with a great deal of amenities for seating, lounges, and we have a great deal of bars and points of sale. This is the Walt Disney Theater. It is a Broadway theater. It seats 2,700 people. Uh, if you've been in the building, um, it's a very, very intimate space for 2,700 seats. This balcony, uh, the first balcony, is very, very close. It's on this midpoint of where the orchestra level is at the uh, Bob Carr. This is completely, uh, the steel is complete in, this build, uh, in the building right now. This is going into the community theater on the second level. This is the Alexis and Jim Pugh Theater. This is a community theater, and in this theater, this floor actually also becomes flat. It's really for emerging arts organizations as well as the University of Central Florida. We have an agreement with them. In addition to, we've already reached out to all the local arts organizations, including uh, uh, community colleges around, uh, around the area as well as high schools. This is stage two. This is what we're raising the funding for right now. This is a very intimate hall. It's 1,700 seats. It has, it's called a multi-form hall, so the shape changes. This is a flat floor. This is not only for amenities and earning more revenue for the Arts Center, it's really for theater and the round and other types of performances. School of the Arts is actually on the south uh, east side. 10,000 square feet is in the actual education facility, but throughout the building um, it's been uh, planned for education as well. And the programs range from 2 to 102. So we're actually uh, doing a program initiative with seniors as well. Second phase here again, this is a rehearsal room. It's the same size as the stage of the 1700 seat theater for um, exactly what the purpose is, is to rehearse here and then actually be on the stage. This is the center's donor lounge, located in a place that the community knows we are always going to be raising funds for this art center from an operational perspective. And this is the DeVos family room. And you see this. This is the room that stretches and kind of marries one block to the other. Uh, orange uh, and, and, and attaches Orange Avenue to our plaza then to the Arts Center. It crosses Magnolia. It's open during the daytime for traffic and it's closed in the evening. And finally what you see here is the plaza. The plaza actually accommodates 3,000 people uh, for uh, free performances. It can either be through uh, broadcasting outside on a large screen, or we have concerts down below. We just went through a renovation of the plaza design. Uh, when we designed this initially in 2007 and 8, the commercial development was to be in place prior to the completion of the art center. So the plaza was actually designed with the intent that the commercial buildings were in place. Since they're not in place, we went and did a hybrid design so we can anticipate uh, that development as it comes in. So here's the, here's the entire nine-acre site. And if you recall, um, when we began this, we actually put a mixed-use development together. And so we planned the Arts Center with commercial activities. And um, a lot of it had to do with just how do you activate an Arts Center's place and make the outside just as important as the inside. You can see here in the red is the revised plaza design. And then the portion in red is actually what we're building. You can see we really cut the building right in half. Now, it was a big impact to the project. In those components, and this is just the activity, we broke ground in 2011. Right now, we're in our 27th month of construction. There's a, 200, a total of $230 million in contract value for um, both design and construction. Um, there are 330 approved companies working on this project. This fall, we'll dry the building in, and then the grand opening is next fall. This is what we're trying to finish the funding for to complete the entire building. And in this last campaign, it's not only to begin construction on the rest of the facility, it's actually finishing up things that we took out of stage one that we need to complete, so it's both. Stage one, um, the timeline, the critical timeline on this is uh, we're hopeful this, this afternoon 
um, that the A&E and pre-construction initiative can actually begin because we need to actually shore the drawings up. We did complete the construction drawings uh, of the entire projects, but codes have changed and so have ADA requirements. And so it needs to be uh, basically scrubbed in many ways and then uh, HKS is becoming the uh, architect of record so they need to be resealed. Um, the capital campaign, our goal is to finish the capital campaign to complete the entire project by the end of 2014. Uh, there's a $10 million challenge gift uh, from Dr. Phillips Charities for us to meet that by the end of 2014 and the gift that is being considered from Orange County or this contribution is also a challenge. If we raise the balance of the funds to get construction started, then those gifts at $35 million comes to the project. We hope to commence construction immediately after the uh, securing of the funds, which would be in the first quarter, if not the first month of 2015. This is, they're very complicated projects. I know it seems like it's been under construction for a very long time. These projects take three years to build. They take 30 months to design, and they take three years to build. Very, very long project, which is a good thing because it keeps people to work for a long time. 163 million will be the approximate contract values for design and construction companies in stage um, uh, stage two, and 330, the same amount of companies will be working on the project. This is a very small slide. I'm happy to give you hard copies and come and meet with you individually if you'd like to see how um, the funding is actually allocated for stage one and for stage two. So the complete project for stage one in terms of funding is 337 million. Stage two is 167 million. The total project value is 503 million. The impact of the delay of the TDT was $75 million in the project. That was to stop the project, to design, redesign the building, to cut it in half, to hold the team in place until that was completed, uh, to secure the funding, to go through some leadership change uh, assessments, and then finally begin construction. That took about a two-year delay. Orange County's contribution so you can see this, is in stage one and stage two. The $53 million that's actually coming for stage one, um, I have to really recognize um, the city. A lot of that was a, in advance. Uh, you basically guaranteed future collections of the TDT so we could actually get stage one started, which we're grateful. In addition to that, we actually had uh, uh, two consortiums of philanthropy guarantee two $8 million letter of credits to also get that started, and that was based on future con uh, collections of the TDC tax as well. Today, uh, we are announcing $106 million in philanthropy. We're very close to making another announcement. We'll probably do that at the end of this year and uh, to just get closer to that final, fi our final goal. If you can believe it, of a $503 million project, we are 92% we are of the way there. That's remarkable that our community has pulled these sources together. We're so close. We feel very comfortable um, with the approval of the $25 million challenge grant from Orange County that we can raise the balance of the funds to get construction started as soon as possible. Here's our path to critical completion. And this is, this is all these dates are all lined up with basically getting everything starting right now for stage two. Um, getting those drawings uh, complete so we can actually pull permits and actually take it to bid has to start right now if we're going to break ground in 2015. So city approval uh, in August. In September, uh, we need to mobilize the design team and really secure getting the drawings completed. May 2014, we're going to submit draw, uh, the drawings uh, for permitting. In September of 2014, we'll be getting negotiating for the GMP um, and then bid to sign, get the bids and complete the subcontractors that will be working on the project. Fourth quarter of 2014, we'd bring that to you for approval for construction and then we begin groundbreaking and then in 2018, the building will be complete. These are the benefits to begin now. Um, we've had so many delays in the project that's, that's impacting the cost, as you know, and that was nothing uh, to do with anything other than a funding dynamic uh, in 2008. The annual cost savings, if we start this right now, is $7.8 million. And that's been the impact of the delays. We also are going to min minimize uh, you know, two things. One, keep the construction moving forward, keep the jobs working, but also minimize inf inflation. Jobs, there are uh, thousands of people that are working on this project right now. And it's pretty 
pretty key that we keep everybody working. They're, as I said, they're very complicated building and take that knowledge and keep them working and going to stage two. We also keep a hold of the intellectual investment that we've made on the teams that have been working on the project. The $25 million uh, from Orange County will provide not only the cost savings, it'll be fiscally responsible, which we've been pushing forward. Momentum of philanthropy is key. Uh, we've always seen that when we're working together collectively, fundraising uh, really has confidence in that type of collaboration. And with Orange County uh, participating with additional funding as the city has done uh, in the past, just so there's more confidence, which means that donors feel, uh, feel like their dollars are actually going to go to complete something that they've already invested in. Uh, jobs, of course, and uh, just the impact, not only on uh, getting this done, but impact in uh, providing more amenities for tourism in the downtown market, along with our hotels in downtown as well. So there are only 36 of these facilities in the world. And I know that we've talked about this a great deal. This is the 37th. They are very hard projects. But the fact that our community is doing this with so many different pro uh, pro uh, partners and pushing it forward really makes it our, our project in Central Florida. And uh, it's been remarkable that we've gotten to where we are today. And it will be even more remarkable in 2015 when we break ground for this final phase of the project. Questions now or after? Let's take them after, Kathy. OK, sounds good. OK, Steve, Florida Citrus Bowl. And this one's um, a little unique because this is the one that the city is actually in charge of the construction. Steve Hogan, president of Florida Citrus Sports. Thank you, Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, appreciate the time today. And uh, we're amazingly excited as a partner of yours for the first time in a, in a long time. I think we're going to we're going to be very proud of uh, what we have to offer down there just west of downtown, and it's going to be an exciting future. So we look forward to being a part of that. I think we're loading up, Craig. Is that right? Steve, while she's loading that, why don't you use the time to uh, just give us a quick update on the status of your bowl negotiations to the extent that you can? Yeah, we're, uh, as many of you know, the postseason landscape changed to a playoff system, and that'll begin in 2014. So next season is the last year of our current contracts, and uh, it's important to us to focus on a couple things. One, we wanted Orlando to compete for a national championship, so that was certainly a, a mandate by our group. Uh, second, we wanted to maintain and, in fact, enhance tourism as it relates to our bowl games. So uh, when we looked at the new playoff series, it was important for us to maintain two bowl games. And if you competed for a playoff series host bowl site, you would have had to drop one of those games. So uh, we thought it important that uh, we maintain our level of impact and grow that. So uh, we chose not to bid. And the fact that uh, you do not need to be a part of that system to compete for a national championship was a critical piece of information as well. So. With that, we were very aggressive as an organization, and I'll talk for a second in here about that investment, but many of you know that uh, we have to pay a significant amount of money for those four teams to come to town uh, late in the year. Currently, it's in the neighborhood of about 13, uh, 13 and a half million dollars a year that we have to raise and pay to those four teams without paying any of our bills or overhead and expenses. Uh, for the new era, we'll start off somewhere in the neighborhood of about 14 and a half million dollars every year. Uh, just for those four teams. So it's an effort, but we're proud of the fact that we're going to end up with in the Russell Athletic Bowl. When you think of the new landscape of college athletics, there are five power conferences in the Pac-12 and the SEC and the Big 12 and uh, the ACC and the Big 10. Um, we, we are going to partner with four of those. And really the Pac-12, who's over on the West Coast, is the only one that we won't. So to think that we'll have a relationship in Orlando with four of the most powerful conferences in the land, schools that stretch from Texas to New York City and everywhere in between, I think is a strategic relationship for us in the national championship. But we'll have the first selection in the ACC and Notre Dame in the Russell Athletic Bowl to play the uh, second post-playoff selection in the Big 12. So we, we're very proud of what that game has become. It'll play in a prime time window on the 28th, 9th, or 30th. And then our Capital One Bowl, which is our 70-year almost crown jewel here uh, in, in our market, will maintain its New Year's Day position at 1 o'clock. 
with the SEC and the Big Ten. So uh, first selections, post playoff series, and so it's it's going to be exciting when you think of some of those matchups that we can put together in bowl week. Orlando is going to be the envy of the national college football community. So. Excuse me, you know, can you say what AACC or whatever those terms are? You just spell it out. What it means. The Atlantic yeah. Coast Conference is oh, okay. uh, is the ACC, that and uh, they now have partnered with Notre Dame. So Notre Dame will be in alignment with that. So we'll have the first choice of all those teams. So that's Florida State, Miami, Clemson, North Carolina, that crew. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they'll play the Big 12, which is Texas, what's, what's Oklahoma, the Big 12? Oklahoma okay, Big 12. State. You saw Kansas State had a big run last year, West Virginia, TCU. And you think of the Southeastern Conference, they got a little team in there, the mayor cares about, the University of Florida, and <laughs> uh, uh, Georgia, okay. South Carolina, of course. And then the Big Ten, as you well know, is, uh, is uh, Ohio State and Michigan and, and Michigan State and Wisconsin. So uh, we really like what, what we've got uh, here. It's going to be expensive, but I think uh, our community is going to enjoy it. Gotcha. So with that, um, I think you know mostly about who we are, so I'll skip over a lot of that. As I already mentioned, 70 years here almost in, in the business, and I think that's something to be proud of. You know, in a community with it's a relatively young community, growing community, to think that we're one of the seventh oldest bowl games in the land is pretty cool. So uh, we're, we're happy to defend that and, and grow that. As you know, we, we use the stadium. I mean, we're more of an entrepreneurial event management company, so we pay money and take risk, hope we're right, and attract visitation to the community, and we, we continue to do that. We're aggressive in doing that, uh, and that's just our focus. We're a tenant of the facility, as you well know, and a partner with the city of Orlando. I mentioned already the new commitment we have over the next six years as a company to raise for those two bowl games. Of course, I think many of you know, and I'd like to come back in another day, a few months down the road, maybe, Mayor, and talk about kind of the community, because I think, uh, although we don't have time today, I'm very excited about not only our commitment in the past, many of you have been a part of our summer camp the last 17 years for, for kids in the region around the stadium. Of course, a day for kids where the players get to spend time with uh, 250, 300 economically disadvantaged kids in our community. And then the million dollar commitment our organization made to launch Take Stock and Children uh, in the region. There's now 135 kids in that program. The first class just graduated. It's, it's really, really cool. But I think the story that's going to be told on television uh, in the next five to ten years, really, is not going to be about how great our stadium is and how unbelievable the new event slates are down the road, but I think what we can do as a partner with the 2,200 homes to begin with, kind of in a, in a ripple out from the stadium, and that's where our community, our focus is as a company going forward, and I think it's going to be a story that no other facility can tell in the country, so one day we'd like to come back and just kind of share our vision for that down the road. Do you know the stadium had a budget of $175 million plus cost escalation, uh, and, and that's the budget that the team has been working on. Proud of where the, the, where the city's been and the design team has been. It's really a best-in-class fan experience has been the focus. A competitive facility, which is critically important. Orlando has to compete, and, and the design team has been focused on that. Also looked at ways that the, the facility can get better over time. You're not going to design your way into, into corners. You know, you're going to allow the building if money and, uh, avails itself down the road for it to get better and better and better. And, of course, an attractive building for those who aim to rent it and use it. When done, uh, you're going to have about you're going to have 56,000 permanent seats in the building with the budget that we currently have, 5,000 club seats uh, with open air clubs on the east and west sidelines, and then of course the existing 24 suites and one party suite uh, that are that currently reside on the east side will stay. That's the base building. When you look at who we compete with in Orlando, every bid that we put out there as we start to attract neutral site games and NFL preseason games and WWEs and the like. Uh, you compete with a lot of these cities and many more, but when you go up and down that list uh, and, and look to the right, you can see where we average out at competition having 76,000 total seats of capacity, 194 suites on average, and 11,000 plus club seats on average. So when you think of those things, you think about suites and club seats paying the bills. Of course, capacity is important, but people are paying a premium for club seats, whether it's a 50 or a $100 lift, you take that times, you know, 11,000 or whatever our delta is. If it's five or six thousand, that's that's uh, 600 grand already that you're behind on your pro forma. So it's they're important and they're also important from an experience standpoint. 
when you talk about the competitive scope, you know, the, the, this is kind of what we as your partner would view along with the design team as, as being necessary to come out of the ground in day one and compete. Uh, which is what we always said our goal was, is to build a facility, although not exactly what other communities have, but one that would be competitive enough that our community would win most of those battles. So in our opinion, some of these components uh, are, are going to be c critical on day one if we're going to compete. The current West Press Box, as you can see, many of you have been there. Um, it's uh, in need of, of some attention and would not be demolished as part of the overall uh, demolition program. It's a part of the upper deck structures that are going to remain. So you can you can tweak that space and create uh, room for 250 riding press down in the yellow shaded area that you see on your diagram there. Some additional premium seating, 10 new suites, uh, eight operational booths in the blue, two party suites in the middle there. So premium seating as well as a more functional uh, operational press box is critical. When you think about who sits here, these are the athletic directors, the commissioners, the national broadcast media, the writers across America, to come out of the ground with a brand new stadium and, and have them sit in one area that is now 20 years old would, would probably be a grave mistake and uh, one that I think deserves attention. So the press box would be an imperative thing in our eyes. Uh, as I mentioned, the permanent seating what do you mean by permanent seating? It's fixed. It feels permanent. It's quality and it meets expectations. Am I messing with something there? It's taking them offline. Our pictures look like. Sorry. I'll keep my thumb off of that. We good? There we go. There we go. Okay. <coughs> permanent fixed seating, as I mentioned. Uh, so in order to get to 65,000 seats, which is kind of a minimum threshold for things like a national championship, basic performance, as I already showed you a few slides ago, we compete with buildings that average about 76,000 seats in total capacity. So we need to get our capacity as close as we can. And for us to be able to do that, we've got to add roughly 10,000 temporary seats. And when you think about temporary seats, you know, again, you can, you can get away with that in some small scope, but this you know, is, is not our best foot forward, the least of which is it costs money to erect temporary seats each time that you do that, and that nets out from your ticket value. So it forces you to be less financially competitive and certainly less experience competitive. Infrastructure for the south end zone expansion is an important change to make, and as you can see in the diagram there, you can plan for the future. You can change the way that the structure for the south end zone is created to support the second level deck, a permanent seating deck, create space for premium seating under that, as well as, and you can see it in the shaded area at the top there, a future 27 suites, which would be necessary for a national championship, uh, potentially World Cups, uh, whether an NFL team wanted to play partial seasons here. That's something that you could do down the road, but creating the infrastructure to be able to do that is important now. Of course, the third level, the, the, the upper decks, which will remain, have been there about 20 years, and they're going to need some attention. So the seats, concessions, and restrooms just need a little love and bring that up uh, to uh, be an important uh, change that, that could correlate with the rest of what will amount to a brand new stadium. We, as I mentioned earlier, we have enough room for 5,000 seats and supporting club space, uh, and currently all of that space would be open air, not exposed you know, from above, but open air. It would not be temperature controlled, and and uh, that can be a cool environment. But in our opinion, when you're competing with indoor club spaces and any other venue, many of you have probably been to, especially NFL facilities, because that's who we compete with here in Orlando is NFL facilities, not college facilities. Uh, it'd be important for us to enclose uh, a portion of our clubs at the very least. And as I mentioned. The gap between us and those we compete with is substantial. 5,000 to 11,500 on average is too much, but by adding south end zone club space when you, when you create that permanent deck, north end zone club space, and then enclosing a portion of the east and west clubs, we can get to 6,500 seats of club-related capacity. That's close enough, in our opinion, to really be competitive uh, with those that we compete against. National championship scope, it's, it's important that we be aware. Uh, what we're talking about today is at least starting on day one, opening in 2015 with a competitive building, but it's not yet national championship ready. If that's something that we want to compete for in the future, we're going to need to do a few extra things 
at that time, closing the rest of the club space, potentially adding those suites, and certainly upgrading digital and wireless technology. To do that, be competitive on day one. We understand the community may not be in a position to financially take both of those on at once, but we think that the competitive scope is imperative, and at $18 million, uh, we can knock that out. And we are willing, as a partner of yours, a nonprofit partner of yours, to come alongside of you. As you well know, we, we approached the county for some additional funding, and uh, the, the mayors have reached an agreement, as you well know, for $12 million in funding from the county that would be a two-to-one match of $6 million from Florida Center Sports that we would raise and invest to make that $18 million number. Somehow, some way, we'll make the $3,251 part of it uh, good, I assure you, Mayor. But uh, that that's kind of the plan, and, and we're excited to come alongside of you, Mayor, and, and help make that happen. So thank you so much for your support. Okay, thank Questions you. Questions later? I think Questions Alan, later. Alan's up next to talk right. about the building and timing. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, and audience members. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm the second part of the Steve show. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit more in-depth into uh, where we're at right now in the design drawings. Some of these drawings you haven't seen yet, so I want to make sure we give you the commissioners a chance to see them uh, before we keep going down the road. And we're excited about where we've been. We've got a great team put together to make this project go forward, uh, working with Steve and, and Turner and Hunt and our uh, SC advisors and our Brent Dahlback is with us back here, and Doug, you are doing a great job, as well as Frank Usina. And so we're excited about where we are and where we're heading. Today I want to talk about the exterior sides, north, east, south, and west, give you a view of those, the hardscape plan, and then the landscape plan. Uh, I guess before you look forward, you always have to look present. And so this is a view from the north uh, to the south of the current stadium. And this is going to be the proposed view in the future, looking from the north to the south. I uh, will put an asterisk. There may be a change in this uh, large scoreboard you see in the center. We may end up going up two smaller boards on the uh, northeast corner and northwest corner. Uh, there's a couple reasons why uh, we're looking at that. One is uh, the cost of that structure. It's about 110 feet tall, it's a, so it's a 10-story building over there in that corner or in the end zone, and uh, there may be some uh, value to adding the boards on the uh, northeast and northwest corner that give us some views from all areas of the stadium, whereas right now this board it would have some difficulty being seen from the um, uh, clubs and from the uh, suites, current suite levels. Kind of a uh, architectural view of the stadium as you see the structure. And this is again from the north to the south, showing you the new infrastructure that we have going in place. So rivet drawn, so it takes a second to load up. This will be the view from the east, from downtown, looking toward the stadium. Current view, and this is the future view of the, of the east elevation. As you can see, uh, the vertical transportation has now moved to the uh, insides with the escalators and the elevators. We have a lot of uh, emphasis on the northeast corner, northwest corner, and the southeast corner where we have large stairs, steps that are kind of a gathering place, kind of like we have at the Amway Center for the Budweiser Baseline Bar. So it leads to a deck in the area where people can gather and, and socialize, and no matter where their ticket's at, if it's in the upper level, mid-level, or lower level, they can meet their friends there in that area. This is a view from the south. It's kind of a, uh, taking a little bit of liberties from the look south looking to the north. And this will be the view when we finish. That is a, a scoreboard that's in the middle there in the conference center that will exist and stay there. And then, uh, again, you see the stairs to the right there. Uh, that's the big stairs leading into the steps leading into that, that entrance at that side. Again, the rivet model takes a second. Uh, one thing I'm really proud of in this design, for the first time ever, we have a back of house. We've never had a back of house there. It's always been you know, golf carts passing you, carrying ice and you know, cokes up to the, uh, the concession stands and you know, players coming this way. We have to block off so players can get in and out. So for the first time ever, we have a, a TV uh, compound. We have a loading dock area, a uh, bus parking area, a secured bus parking area. So we're now going to be able to move a lot of this uh, infrastructure that we've never had to the south end zone where we can... Uh, Keep, uh, keep that area separate from the public entrances so we can operate the venue without worrying about the safety of patrons crossing or under our work function. This is a view from the west, current view. 
and this will be the view of the west elevation once completed. Uh, you can see a little less uh, panels on this side, but more paint, and still with that same uh, general scheme of the color scheme and the open air feel for the stadium. Hardscape and landscape. Uh, we decided when uh, we actually did this in the Amway Center where one side is green and the other side is orange, east and west, uh, that it's very nice to color code these areas and to allow the patrons, you can tell them you need to go to the blue area or the green area or whatever area. So we theme these areas, uh, as you can see, citrus water, uh, flowers and bloom and palm, and we'll show you how we're going to emphasize those areas and allow some uh, neat little uh, activity to, to occur in those areas. So this is one area how we do it. We would in, uh, in the pavement, it would be an orange and engraving and, and texture work that will allow us to identify the area as, as whatever we call it, you know, orange gate or whatever if it gets branded. And it allows for a really nice pedestrian. This is the view on uh, Rio Grande. This is the northeast corner. So, you know, uh, sit, uh, I'm sorry, church would be to the right and Rio Grande would be the road in front of you. Nice wide pedestrian walkway that we don't have now. We have a small sidewalk, if you recall. We also have to close the street because the patrons now use the street as a, the pathway. Again, a view looking from the um, south toward the north, back toward uh, church at Rio on your right-hand side there. Again, large areas, a lot of uh, palms. It gives a nice uh, feeling. Uh, the building to the left is much more open than that showed right now. It's just on for purposes right there to show you that the building's right at right the location. This is a street level view, again. And I'm going to talk about these uh, large uh, uh, circular things in a second because uh, I think they're a pretty neat feature that we all uh, kind of like and I think it's going to add greatly to the uh, guest experience upon arrival. This is how we're going to do the um, hardscape work to identify it. It's fairly uh, inexpensive, but it will last for a while and it gives it a distinctive fit, uh, flair to it. The colors didn't pop out as much as we like, but they will when, once we do the work on there. Another street level, showing that again. I'm not going backwards. And this is what those uh, planters will look like, um, the uh, ornamental vines, uh, once they're completed. Pretty nice uh, feature. I think the mayor's seen some out uh, west, and, and they look uh, really nice to feature to our, our stadium. This is the variety of the palms that we're using, the magnolia, in the southwest uh, corner. I'm sorry, southeast corner. We have a little planter. Uh, look at the fencing uh, that we're going to have instead of the, you know, we had the chain link for a while, now we're going to have this fence. These fences are actually cool because they actually slip swing in and become our gates. So they actually become gates and we call it chutes, so that allows patrons to come through then chutes. But we'll protect the property when, it, you know, <coughs> when it's not, off, not in use. As Steve mentioned, the current seating plan uh, is going through, and this might take a second, so I apologize for that. But, uh, we are currently, with the new money that if it's approved from the county and Steve's contribution and some other sources, are going to be able to get to the 65000 as which has been our minimum goal to go through, uh, to keep us competitive, as Steve mentioned, for uh, not only the bowl games, but neutral site games, uh, NFL preseason games. And uh, we think we have the plan here in place to do that fairly easy, especially with the addition of the South um, uh, up a mid-level deck that perm is that is a permanent at one point that we didn't have the money to do that with this new money we're going to be able to put that mid-level in the south end zone which is important to us. Again the seating sections this is showing the uh, club seats. And this is showing the complete bowl. Or maybe this one is Cleveland. And this is the seats and the location of um, uh, the sidelines. On the sidelines, and this will give you the seat count. On the sidelines, <coughs> the seats are actually chairs, uh, you know, seats with a back and an arm. Uh, the end zones right now are programmed to be a bench with a back. Right now, we just have benches, we don't have the back. Of course, we're going to be current codes, ADA, as well as a comfort level. You have, uh, for the first time ever, you'll have the uh, enjoyment of sitting in a citrus bowl without somebody's knees in your back or your knees in somebody else's back, which I think we're all going to appreciate because we have the proper tread depth. Uh, we are looking at the club seat configuration with Steve and his input to uh, maybe uh, change that. That's in the orange, uh, make it a little easier to get people into the clubs uh, that we have, the three clubs on each side. Uh, if we get the uh, when we get the new money, they will have one enclosed club on each side, which would be air conditioned, climate controlled year round, and the other two would be uh, open 
uh, again, there's nothing. It's not open to the above it. It's just at each end and be open. But uh, even the club has glass in front, of it so you can see out to the field and see back to the city because it's a beautiful view from up there. If you haven't seen that view from the suite level before, it's one of the best views toward downtown that you can get. And this is a uh, my final slide, but it's, it's actually a rendering as if we uh, when we get the money for and have the need to add suites in the south end zone. That uh, shows you the suites wrapped around the top of the, uh, behind the scoreboard in the south end zone and shows you what the stadium will look like when it's completed with a full build out for a national championship game or for an NFL team if they desire to move here. But we're putting the infrastructure in to be able to support that now. We're not building the suites in the south end zone at this time, but if we need to in the future and funding is available, we can do that. But we're prepared to do that. We don't have to go in and add any structure to that. It. It's going to be in place already. And I think I can't get out of that, so I have to have help. I know we're doing questions at the end, and I believe uh, Orlando City Soccer follows. Okay. Me. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Steve. Bill, you ready to go? Congratulations on a big win on Saturday. I like those games where you put it away in the first couple of minutes after three <laughs> goals. Always helps. Helps the hall. Helps the blow pressure. Who's your opponent this next weekend? We've got uh, Charleston on Friday night. The uh, the uh, back me out game on uh, Sunday. So we play a little bit earlier and work with Alan on uh, getting the field ready for Friday night to, to host them. And uh, just hoping that Charlotte can beat Richmond so we can host the championship game the following Saturday. Okay. Uh, we have a quick. Alan. Oh. <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine. Okay. Um, thank you for your patience and I uh, appreciate the time to be with you this morning, uh, Mayor, Commissioners. Um, thank you. Um, I want to share with you the, uh, the exciting story and the exciting picture that is Orlando City and the opportunity that we have uh, and to ask for your support uh, to help us move this franchise to the next level and bring a Major League Soccer franchise here to Orlando. So um, let me start if I can at 30,000 feet and just paint a picture for you uh, that will culminate in, in looking at Orlando City and where we are today. Uh, but let's start at the top of the game. Um, as you know, soccer is the number one sport in the, in, in the world and the most popular sport with 3.2 billion people uh, watching the last World Cup in South Africa. Uh, to put that into context, that's about 31 times the TV audience in the Super Bowl. Um, so it gives everybody a little, I think, perspective for just how huge this game is. It's a game that, that obviously unites nations, countries, peoples all across the globe. What most people don't know is that over the course of the last um, 15 or 20 years, it's also become the number one sport in, in the U USA as well. It's become the number one participation sport with nearly 20 million young athletes playing the game. It's the fastest growing sport in the country. It's becoming increasingly popular uh, with our younger population, certainly you know, the up to 35 age group, the young adults of Hispanics taking a tremendous interest in the game. Just to reinforce that, this is a, uh, a slide that uh, ESPN uh, data from a, a poll they did a few months ago. Um, and this was looking at particularly young people aged 12 to 24. Uh, and you can see the two columns here. Uh, in the overall population, professional soccer, not youth soccer, but professional soccer, ranked as the number two favored sport in this demographic across the country. And with Hispanics, it obviously rated number one with 24% of the sport support above NFL. Um, this speaks, in my mind, to the future growth of this sport. It's here, it's arrived. It's arrived in many parts of this country. There's yet to really take a hold uh, in the southeast in the way in which it could. But if we look at the future of the game across the country, it is very, very bright indeed. So, Orlando City Soccer Club, who are we? Um, let's get down to, to Central Florida. Um, Orlando City currently plays in USL Pro. That's equivalent to AAA baseball, if you will, to, to give you a benchmark for it. Uh, we've had a very, very successful three years since arriving in Central Florida. 
Uh, we've been the regular season champions for the last two years, 2011, 2012. We missed out on the regular season uh, title this year by one point to Richmond. Um, however, we've, we've led the league for most of the year. We intend, if we can, to win a second championship for Orlando in the coming weeks. And as you know, we, we host the semi-final this coming Friday. Um, our slide is slightly out of date. I produced this about two weeks ago. I'm, I'm pleased to say that we've now gone over 8,000 for our regular season average. We finished the regular season with two 10,000 crowds uh, at the Citrus Bowl. Uh, it's by far and away the highest minor league soccer attendance anywhere in the country outside of major league soccer. Including that 8,000 average uh, attendance is about 4,500 season ticket holders. Uh, throughout, again, throughout Central Florida. We draw from nine counties on a regular basis. If we're at the MLS level, we would certainly draw from Jacksonville and Tampa as well and bring people into the marketplace uh, from all across Central Florida. Our goals, and our goal since we first came here, is to, bring, is to bring Major League Soccer and a second professional Major League franchise to Orlando. In doing so, though, we're, we're treading a very proven uh, path. There are four teams that played at our level, at the USL Pro level, that currently play at Major League Soccer. And they've all made the move in the last five or six years. We mentioned three of them on this slide here. Montreal, Portland, and Vancouver. The fourth one is Seattle. And the only reason I've left Seattle off is that they skew the statistics uh, even further. These, I think the statistics tell a great story as they are with these three teams. If you include Seattle in, it takes the growth to over 250%. Uh, last night, uh, I was watching on my TV at home, uh, Seattle had 67,000 people for the game against Portland. It was sold out three weeks ago. Um, but let's just take the three that are on the slide, Montreal, Portland, Vancouver. All three of these teams have taken the same path that we've taken. You'll see in the first column their last season's attendance uh, before going to Major League Soccer. That was the last year they played in USL Pro. One important point to point out here is that all of them at this point in their history would have known they were going to Major League Soccer because typically the franchise is awarded about 24 months to 18 months before you start playing. So the point I'm making here is this column that shows their attendance, they already knew they were going to be a Major League Soccer team at that point. Okay, So people are getting in line for season tickets and so on. The second column shows their first season in Major League Soccer and the far right-hand column shows the average increase in their attendance. There's a huge jump here between going from minor league to major league. The key point is, if you look at our figures on the bottom of the slide, we're already at about 8,000, the best outside of major league soccer today. If you look at anything like a typical growth pattern from those three teams, which we expect to get, that bump in attendance when you go to major leagues would take us to around 20,000 on average in our soccer stadium, week in and week out in downtown Orlando. That means we'd have a full stadium week in, week out. But we're more than just a professional club. We're also a community club and a very strong youth club. Um, our organizational structure goes from the professionals at the top, our under-23s or our reserve team, if you will, uh, the next tier down, and then below that, a whole youth academy from ages 18 down to 6. Uh, almost 2,000 children play in that youth academy week in and week out again from all over Central Florida, and we, we work very closely uh, with the support of, of the Arnold Palmer Children's Hospital uh, as our main sponsor. We also have the highest level of play for both boys and girls in the country in the Development Academy and ECNL status that we mentioned there. So the highest level of play all the way down to rec play. But we also take our position in the community extremely seriously. Uh, we are very much a community-centric club. Uh, I don't think you'd find another organization in Central Florida that does as much in the community as we do, especially with our players. All of our players are contracted uh, to do community work at our direction and behest, um, and they do that very, very willingly. Seven of our players have their own individual causes, uh, and they range from everything from, for example, uh, the New Hope Youth Center uh, in Paramore uh, through to To Be Kind, which is an anti-bullying campaign, uh, through to Eric Ustruck, uh, who's raising funds for new freezer cabinets and chillers um, uh, for the Mini Mart in Paramore as well. So we have a range of activities that our players get involved in. Most of them, in fact nearly all of them, focus on uh, challenge of, uh, managing the challenge of obesity, about health, wellness, exercise, 
and using soccer and mentorship to do, uh, to do the very best work that we can with our young children. This is a, a slide that just uh, depicts a few of the people that we work with. Uh, New Image Youth Centre, Coalition for the Homeless, Easter Seals, etc., etc. Um, Easter Seals is an organisation that's very close to the heart of Jamie Watson, um, as he's, uh, his brother um, is, a, is a disabled uh, young person, uh, and he works very, very closely as their, as their poster child, if you will, for Easter Seals here in Central Florida. So, Major League Soccer, our future. Uh, what does this look like? What are our steps? First of all, um, again, it's a fact that most people do not know. Major League Soccer in the last couple of years has surpassed uh, hockey and basketball as the number three best attended sport in the country. Major League Soccer is currently averaging around about 19,000 per game every week, week in, week out across the country. Um, I've given you some sample attendances there for similar <laughs> sized cities. Kansas City, where, um, where the mayor and, and staff visited uh, last year, Salt Lake and Portland, all, as you can see, averaging around 18, 19, 20,000 per game. Uh, certainly attendances that we could expect to draw here in Orlando. The season runs from March to November, uh, so it's a longer season than we currently play. Starts at the beginning of March, finishes around Thanksgiving. 16 of the 19 teams in the league currently play in soccer-specific stadiums, and that's an important point that we'll, we'll come on to. And there's extensive television coverage. So not only are we playing in every major marketplace across the country and also in Canada, uh, but we've got extensive TV coverage with the likes of ESPN, NBC and Univision all carrying the games uh, across their networks. So what's our opportunity? Um, you can see here on the map uh, there's a quartile uh, coloured purple for obvious reasons down in that southeastern corner uh, that doesn't have access to and doesn't have a Major League Soccer team. There's no Major League Soccer franchise south of Washington, D.C. or east of Houston. That's a quarter of the population without direct access to the sport. And yet in the rest of the country, it's growing like gangbusters. I was up in Portland last week, just to give you a, a little feel for this. I was at the Portland uh, Rail Salt Lake game last Wednesday. Wednesday, at Wednesday evening game, 8 o'clock kickoff, sold out 21,000 people. One of the people in our party went for a run at 5.30 in the morning. Uh, it was an 8 o'clock kickoff in the evening. There was people outside the stadium queuing for tickets at 5.30 in the morning. That's the kind of passion, that's the kind of um, uh, excitement that this league has garnered across the rest of the country. And it's certainly garnered that interest here in Orlando. It's something we hope to build on and capture and work with. We've got an opportunity here which will not last for long. It's got a, it's got a time stamp associated on it. Um, the commissioner, Commissioner Garber, came out about two weeks ago at the All-Star Game uh, after consultation with the owners and said that there will be only four franchises awarded between now and the end of the decade. Uh, we're in line, we're the top of the queue to get one of those franchises. We can take one of those four franchises off the table before the end of this year with your support and we can leave the rest of the country fighting over the remaining three. Major League Soccer wants to put two of those franchises in the southeast. We face tremendous competition for that. Make no mistake, we lead the race today, but we can be caught very quickly if we don't take the opportunity that's in front of us, seize that opportunity and act upon it. Um, our competition will come from the likes of Atlanta, from the likes of Miami, uh, from Nashville, uh, potentially even from Tampa. Uh, and remember that only two of those franchises will go in the southeast. We'd like to take the Orlando one out of the equation quickly and let the rest of them fight over who wants to be number two in the southeast. So, um, as many of you will know, we've been working with Major League Soccer now for about two and a half to three years. Regular meetings, regular updates, regular opportunities to interact with, with their key staff. Um, when we first met with them, when I sat down with them two and a half years ago, they said very clearly there was three things that we needed to do. One was prove the marketplace. Two was prove the ownership group. And the third was an MLS compliant stadium. And let me just walk you through those, those three very quickly. Um, proven marketplace, we've done that. We've proven the marketplace is here for soccer. Uh, with the highest attendance outside of Major League Soccer consistently for three years, I think there's no doubt that there is soccer fever and there's soccer support in this community uh, for Major League Soccer, and that will only grow as we get to the Major Leagues. The ownership group has, has proven itself time and time again as an operating organization. We pride ourselves on the way we operate and our professionalism uh, and our ability to deliver a great quality product to the fans. 
We improved that ownership group uh, in the early part of this year by the addition of Flavio Augusto de Silva, um, a resident of Orange County. Uh, he lives uh, in Windermere, uh, Brazilian by birth, uh, tremendous passion uh, for the sport of soccer, uh, and, a, and a great entrepreneur and a great leader. Um, he joined our ownership group in February uh, and will, over the course of next year or so, become the majority owner uh, in, in the franchise. Let me turn our attention to the, to the last point here, and it's the reason that we're here. It's the, it's the MLS Soccer Compliance Stadium. I get this question pretty much 10 times a week. Why can't we play in the Citrus Bowl? So before you ask me at the end, I'll answer it now, so I know some will ask it. We would love to play in the Citrus Bowl. It would save us $30 million to play in the Citrus Bowl. We would love to do that. We just won't be allowed to do that. We made it very clear from day one, it is not an option. The Citrus Bowl will be a great facility, and I, I compliment Steve and Alan, um, Florida Citrus Sport, and all the work they're doing. It'll be a tre tremendous facility. It's just not the right facility for soccer to, to, uh, to thrive, to grow, and to do well in this community. And it's a stipulation of Major League Soccer that we have to have a soccer-specific stadium. Um, let me tackle what a soccer-specific stadium is, because only about two years ago did I hear the term soccer-specific stadium. Um, it's really a multi-purpose stadium, so let's, let's correct that first of all. It's a stadium which can be used for many other sports than just soccer. Um, what it means is you have a roof over the fans, uh, to keep out the worst of the weather. You have a grass field, and you have a, a stadium which comfortably houses about 18 to 20,000 people to create the right atmosphere for a sport like soccer, but for also many other sports too. Um, and I'm hoping that if the technology works right now, I'll show you why we really need that stadium to make this franchise flourish. I don't know if this will work with sound or not, but with sound it's great. Without sound it's really good. <laughs> okay. It's going to be great. <laughs> I hope you can uh, see from that brief video the opportunity that we have in front of us. Um, we have, quite honestly, some of the best fans in the country. We have a tremendous fan base. They create a great atmosphere, even at the Citrus Bowl. I'm amazed every Saturday night when I go down there just what they do for the sport and what they do to support the team. Put them in the right environment, put them in the right stadium, and we've got a, a winning combination. And Major League Soccer knows that. They're very supportive of bringing the franchise here to Orlando. They want us to get this done. So. Uh, what do we need to do? Um, we have a, a, a site picked out uh, with your help, with the help of the city. Um, you found us two city blocks just to west of the Amway Center. Uh, in our opinion, it's a perfect location. It could not be better. As you can see from the diagram in front of you, we've got over 16,000 car parking spaces within half a mile of the facility. Um, we would have two sunrail stations within walking distance of the facility. It would be right on Church Street. 
It would further complement the sports entertainment district that, that we're building here as a community with the, uh, the Citrus Bowl anchoring one end uh, of this great facility and then down at the other end, Deepak uh, and all the great facilities that, that uh, the Performing Arts Center brings. A tremendous sports entertainment corridor right along Church Street and, and the soccer stadium will be a great piece of that just two blocks from the Amway Center. So what do we bring to, uh, to make all of this work and what is the, uh, the team's commitment? First of all, there's a direct impact uh, that we bring, the economic impact of construction and operation of the stadium, but the ability also of the stadium to host not only Major League Soccer games, but also many, many other sports I'll come to talk about. Um, along with that, increased visitation, increased tax dollars, and of course the opportunity to really take the world's most visit, excuse me, the world's favorite sport and marry it with the world's most visited city. Right, Mayor? Right. Mm. It's the Mayor's phrase. Well, actually, <laughs> Borrow it from Phil. Borrow. <laughs> um, but it's a great opportunity to really extend the brand of Orlando around the world. Um, we had a, uh, a set of external consultants, CSNL from Dallas, uh, conduct an uh, economic impact study. This was released in October of last year. It showed that over $1.2 billion worth of economic impact for the region over the next 30 years from the development of the uh, of the soccer stadium and for all its uses. Further to that, we are in negotiation currently with Major League Soccer, uh, and part of that negotiation, uh, we have pitched to bring at least one, if not two, all-star games to Orlando in the first few years of the franchise, and also the opportunity for each year in the first five years to bring a major international game as well. And let me explain why this is possible. Um, major League Soccer owns an organization called Soccer United Marketing. Soccer United Marketing is a image rights company, a marketing company, a television rights company that takes care of all of the men's and women's international games. So the, the US men's national team, the US women's national team, the Mexican national team when playing outside of Mexico, Barcelona when playing in North America and so on and so on. So they have rights to many, many properties uh, across soccer. Um, they get to decide where those games are played. So as part of our franchise negotiation, we're trying to do the very best we can for, for Central Florida and for the city to bring as many of those games here as we can in the first few years. We believe uh, quite firmly that we'll get at least one all-star game and at least five major international games. Some of those games, the international games, will attract an attendance in the 40 to 50,000 region. And so we would look to play those games uh, with Steve's backing and support at the Citrus Bowl. So we're talking about the equivalent of bringing maybe another bowl game every year to the community as well. Uh, that's the kind of economic impact that Major League Soccer and the soccer stadium allows us to have. The numbers on there, by the way, are the numbers that were verified for visitation purposes. Uh, by visit, visit Orlando when we when we put this together. But the stadium can be used for so much more than just soccer as well. It can be used for other events. And, and here on this chart you see some examples of what it could be used for. The NCAA is seeking a home for its final four for both men's and women's soccer. It would love to bring those, bless you, it would love to bring those uh, events to Orlando. It would love to have a permanent home here in Central Florida. So we could see the NCAA final four for men and women being played in that stadium on a regular basis. Lacrosse, uh, state high school uh, football championships, um, rugby, um, college games, uh, all of those, be it lacrosse, be it, be it American football, be it soccer, could all be played at the stadium. Uh, and again, many of those uh, events take place in the, the low period of visitation to the city. Uh, they take place in September through to early December a great time to fill up room nights in the city and the county. So what else do we bring? Um, as you know, we have an, a Brazilian board investor. Um, we have major ties to both Europe and Brazil with our ownership groups. Um, the Brazilian marketplace is becoming an increasingly important market uh, for Central Florida, and they love soccer, and they love soccer with a passion. We can bring more visitors to this region from Brazil because we have Major League Soccer. The Brazilian population, especially the family population, does not attend soccer in Brazil today uh, for many, many reasons. Um, stadium issues, uh, violence issues sometimes, 
um, just not the right crowd for you to be with, in with a young family. When they come to a place like Orlando, they will bring their family and their children to watch games here, especially if we have a couple of major Brazilian stars on our team, which we intend to do. So we know, we know very clearly that we can impact Brazilian visitation to the area with soccer. We will further impact that, uh, one of our commitments is to bring with the franchise what we've labeled a Brazilian Beckham. I think everybody knows who David Beckham is. Uh, he made a, a major impact on soccer in this, on this country when he played for the LA Galaxy for, for the last five years. We would bring an equivalent to Beckham, uh, but from a Brazilian background, that would have just as much draw, pull, and cachet in Latin America as David Beckham did in, in Europe. Um, the player we're talking about is, is, is known worldwide uh, and is one of the top international players of the game. Uh, and he would not be the only international star on the team. We would bring at least one, if not two. That obviously drives awareness for the team. It drives awareness for Orlando. But it drives, again, incremental visitation. Let's give you an example of that. Um, right now, Miami draws about 634,000 Brazilian visitors on an annual basis. We call this slide the, the power of one. What if we could just shift 1% of that visiting population to Orlando? That's not a huge ask, but it does make a massive difference. If we shifted 1% of that visitation to Orlando, we bring an estimated extra 6,340 visitors. At the rates that the Brazilians spend in our economy, that equates to the equivalent of 11 million, over $11 million <coughs> of incremental spending in Central Florida just because we can bring that impact. Right. And that will be on an annual basis. But that's not all. Uh, we've also pledged through Flavio's uh, kind works to work in cooperation with Visit Orlando on a pro promotional campaign down in Brazil to promote not only the soccer team, but also the area, Central Florida, Orlando as a destination, the parks, the hotels, the conference facilities, all the facilities that we know and love uh, that we have in our community. So what does the stadium take? Um, we would build the stadium in two phases. Phase one, uh, as you can see here, team contribution of 30 million in cash, and then a guarantee uh, of a further 10 million of revenues generated from the stadium. Um, the city of Orlando uh, would bring 15 million, plus uh, the opportunity of a up to a further 5 million of funds related to items, such as direct purchasing, et cetera, uh, and tax breaks that we can get on that. Um, Orange County, we've asked for 20 million. And then from other sources, uh, the state and other, other, other municipalities, we will get a further 5 million. Total of 80 million uh, in, in phase one, uh, which will build as a high quality stadium at about 18 to 19,000 in capacity that could be easily expanded up to a, about 23, 24,000 uh, in the coming years. Phase two, um, you know that we went and spoke uh, in Tallahassee to the state uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, we unfortunately uh, didn't get the 30 million in sales tax rebate that we were looking for, uh, but that wasn't because of a lack of, of uh, belief in the project or a lack of support for the project. Uh, we got wrapped up in and some unfortunate politics that surrounded the Dolphins uh, and uh, couldn't get the, the vote to go through the House. We will, though, return to Tallahassee uh, in 2014 and look to get that same sales tax rebate that's been extended to every other professional sports team in the state uh, and extend that to include Major League Soccer. Once we do that, uh, we can bring in a further $30 million of improvements to the stadium in phase two. We do not need that immediately. It doesn't have to come in. Um, uh, I, I admire uh, the way Kathy uh, and her group built uh, the Performing Arts Center and took a very brave decision to chop that building in half. We unfortunately can't do that with a soccer stadium. Playing on half a pitch <laughs> wouldn't work. Um, so we will have to build out a complete stadium, which we can do for the $80 million. The extra 30 we're going to improvements. Increased capacity, more suites, uh, more press facilities, more premium seating, uh, a supporters club on site, uh, <laughs> some extra premium facilities and things like that. We've got it very, very well planned out, but rest assured, that phase one gives us everything we need in the you know, for the immediate future. Okay, so in summary, uh, what are we bringing to the table, and, and what are we asking for? Um, 
On the left-hand side of the chart here, you see all that we bring, both tangible and intangible. Tangibly, uh, we're bringing $1.2 billion worth of economic impact, as CSNL predicts, over the next 30 years. International games. Per year, we could bring in approximately 5.5 million in visitation, uh, in tax revenues from the international games. An all-star game would generate roughly the same amount, about 5.7 million. If we can shift 1% of Brazilian visitors, that's a further 11 million. Our partnership with, uh, with Visit Orlando, we've pledged to put 5 million into that promotional campaign in Brazil over the next five years. And then a cash investment and commitment from the team that is now in excess of $100 million. That includes $70 million for the franchise and a further $40 million to the stadium. Intangibly, we can bring the area's second major league sports franchise. And I think Alex Martin put it best when he said that our chance for a second major league franchise, our best chance, lies with soccer. It doesn't lie with football. It doesn't lie with baseball at this point in time. It lies with soccer. It lies with major league soccer. And we can do that. My commitment to you is if, if we can get this done, I believe we can bring a major league soccer team before the end of this year. But there's more intangibles too. In, in, improved quality of life, increased global awareness. Imagine marrying this great city with the world's biggest game. We can take this to a completely different level on a global stage. We can take Orlando to be a completely different brand uh, and, and really go to a different level of brand awareness for this community by marrying these two together. I'll give you one very quick example of that. We launched a Brazilian Facebook site four days ago. In the last four days, we've got over 11,000 followers in four days in Brazil. And we, even, we haven't even promoted it. That's just word of mouth. We haven't even put out on our website that we've got it. I think that gives you a feeling for some of these intangibles and what they can mean in tangible visitation, and tangible support for this project, and also the brand awareness we create for Orlando. And never forget, the name is emblazoned into the badge. Wherever it goes around the world, it says Orlando City. What's our request? Um, a contribution from the tourist tax of $20 million. So um, what we'd ask, commissioners, mayor, uh, as I know this is not a, a vote today, but at some point you will get to a vote. We'd ask you to approve the expansion of the interlocal agreement, provide an initial $20 million that we can put in to the building of a major league soccer stadium in downtown Orlando. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. And then our last presenter is John Bisgnano. Did I say that right? Exactly right. Who is the, have you been on board about a year now? 14 months. 14 months, okay. President and CEO of the Central Florida Sports Commission. Thank you, Mayor Dyer. Thank you, Commissioners. Appreciate the time this morning. Um, the Central Florida Sports Commission, it's real easy. Um, basically, we're not a franchise, uh, nor are we a venue. Uh, we are basically a sports marketing machine. And uh, what we do is very simple. We drive events into this community that bring new visitors and incremental room nights to Central Florida. And then uh, we have two key strategies. First, it's driving marquee events, and second, championship events. A good definition of a marquee event is March 20 through 22, 2014, NCAA March Madness returns to Central Florida for the first time in 10 years. It's a good example of a marquee event. It's in the Amway Center. It will drive an incremental 10,000 visitors to our destination and drive 14,000 room nights. An example of a championship event. Several months ago, just back in June, the AAU, who's been part of our community since 1997, hosted a 1920-team volleyball tournament at the Orange County Convention Center and at ESPN's Wide World of Sports Complex. That event alone drove 45,000 room nights to this destination. And there's a whole plethora of events that fall into that championship category. So with that, just a quick overview.
As you can see, it's a good story of the types of events that we've hosted and plan to bring in this destination. Just to give you a little bit of a background on the sports landscape, there's several of our board members here today from the Central Florida Sports Commission. First, you heard Phil Rollins, who's on our board, talking about the global sport of soccer and how big that is. Alan Johnson, Orlando Venues, <clears throat> talking with Steve Hogan on just the scope of the college sports marketplace and what those college events will bring to the Citrus Bowl. And of course, Mike Millay. Mike uh, was my boss at ESPN's Wide World of Sports Complex. We worked together since 1994 <clears throat> to drive amateur sports to our destination. When Mike and I first got in the business back in 1993, the chair of Disney at the time, Michael Eisner, made a pretty bold comment that entertainment's a $40 billion business and Disney owned it. And sports was a $200 billion business. We peeled back the onion of that $200 billion business and we saw that driving events to this destination could truly drive incremental visitation and economic impact to this region. It's a proven model and it works. So today that number that was back in 1993, 1994, 200 billion is anywhere from 480 billion to a $600 billion business. So what we look at right now is true opportunity, but it's extremely competitive out there. I referenced Mike, Mike, and I both chaired the National Association of Sports Commissions. When Mike chaired it, I believe it was 16 cities. When I chaired it, it was 200 cities. Today, there's 300 cities that are members of the National Association of Sports Commission, and they have the same exact mission as we do, to get after it, find value events that make sense for their destination. <clears throat> A good friend of mine, his name is John Webb, runs the Florida Sports Foundation. We sat with him in a meeting, and it was just recently back in May. And he said, a successful sports commission, it comes down to just three really simple things. One, great venues. Guess what? We have them. With what we're discussing today, we have them. We're right in the game. Two, venue availability. So, of course, if you have an NFL stadium and you want to put a great event during an NFL week, it's going to be really difficult to do. And then three is funding. Funding is as necessary of being in the game as any of those pillars. So just to give you an example, if you take a look at just the state of Florida, there's 24 sports commissions in the state of Florida and central Florida. I'm not talking about Orange County in Orlando. We represent five counties. We are number eight out of 24, and there's no reason for that. If you take a look at the national landscape, Cities like Dallas, that Steve referenced earlier, Houston, San Antonio, Atlanta, Indianapolis, you go right down the line, they are way here on the chart compared to where we are today. So to get us in the game, it's real simple. Basically, we use this example of a clear, competitive, defendable advantage out in the marketplace. And it starts, one, with destination. We all know. Climate, 57 million visitors going to 100 million visitors. We're definitely in the game here with destination. Two, I call it assets. Airport, hotels, attractions. None better in the world. World class in those three categories. Three, venues. Why we're here today. We're talking about a new Citrus Bowl. We're talking about the best arena in the country in the Amway Center. We're talking about a premier soccer stadium the Dr. Phillips Performing Arts Center and our Orange County Convention Center. Puts us right at the top of the list. And then number four is team. And under team is that funding piece that falls into place there. So we use all those four pieces to talk about our five-year plan. And our five-year plan comes down to real simple, what you saw in that slide. We have 18 events on our calendar today that basically will drive $400 million of economic impact to Central Florida. And they're a nice mix of those marquee events and those championship events. And just to give you an example on the marquee events, I mentioned March Madness. We have a strong bid in for the 2016. Uh, if you remember, we just did it a few years ago, WrestleMania to come back to Central Florida. In 2019, we're looking at uh, USA Gymnastics to bring the World Championships uh, back to Central, to Central Florida in a neat time, 34,000 room nights 
with uh, coming in a neat time in the fall uh, into central Florida. So the marquee events sprinkled as you pulse them through, if you look at it right now, the NCAA, 84 out of 89 of their championships are up for bid right now. We just submitted our bid in for the events that we're choosing. Now there's marquee events in there, whether it's men's frozen four hockey, or men's wrestling, or women's Final Four basketball, or more regional basketballs leading into the Final Four, coming to the destination. And then transitioning that, going into championship events. I mentioned the volleyball event. In a few months, we're hosting one of the largest women's lacrosse tournaments in the country, with every single women's lacrosse coach coming to our destination, and we'll drive 180 teams in year one, and already talking to the right soul, they're going well over 240 teams if we had the field availability for them in that standpoint. Along with that, just transitioning into the NCAA, as Phil mentioned earlier, there's plenty of those championships, 84 out of 89. We have a bid in for 25 of those championships right now. So we have some marquee, but a majority are in that championship level. So this next slide will just give you an indication of what Phil hit on some of them, but those six NCAA championships that we're bidding on will drive 11,000 visitors to our destination, all in neat time. And with that, uh, it's a little bit more definition to those events that would be coming into the community through uh, the use of the soccer stadium. So one of the opportunities when this first was presented to us to get into the game was really identifying neat time. So our friends at Visit Orlando do a great job. They have an occupancy report. A lot of hoteliers are very familiar. A lot of us are very familiar with an occupancy report is. And you take a look at that occupancy report and you look at need time. And then what we've done is we take, took a look at that and look at it and expand it out into 14, 15, and 16 and identify that need time. And I think most of us know it's the end of August, September, and as you go through it, the first couple of weeks of December, first weeks of January. So as you're looking at the events, our team is very 100% focused on bringing events into need time. So let's use the example of March Madness just very quickly. March Madness happens at one time a year. That's not a need time for us, though. Those other championships, those commissioners, those athletic directors, all the influencers in that sports committee members are here in our destination. They know about our destination, so it puts us into the game to bid on those other events in the need time. You could do that with every sport. So whether it's the NCA space or college space, or whether it's the Olympic space. I'll use one more example. USA Gymnastics, to bring a world championship here in the fall, two years ago we hosted the World Acro Championships on no one's radar screen. But what the World Acro Championships did a much smaller discipline in gymnastics did was bring the FIG, the Federation of Industry International Gymnastics. All their key players, stakeholders of their board came to the U.S. for the first time since 1993 and got a chance to taste our world-class destination, which definitely put us in the game for a fall event coming through. So you can see it's, very, it's a very simple model to peel back that onion. It's based on venue availability, venue need, and then target that need period. And we're doing that literally by sport, by market segment, and then literally by venue down the line. So when we look at that need time, and that question consistently comes up when we're out in the marketplace, know that we, along with Steve, who's doing the same thing with those preseason football games, or along with Phil, who's looking at doing the same thing with the soccer stadium. We're 100% focused on identifying those need times. But more important is we're going to have a very vibrant calendar of events for all these new venues that come in. I'm not going to discount Kathy. WrestleMania, when that comes back into town, if you think of WrestleMania, what it needs, it uses every one of those venues. It uses the new Citrus Bowl. As we know, 78,000 fans when it was here just a few short years ago. It uses the Performing Arts Center to host hospitality and other events that they have with it. It uses the or Orange County Convention Center for access, and it also for their access event, which is the big fan fest. And it also uses the Amway Center for two, two events on the Hall of Fame 
and also for their Monday Madness uh, event. So literally these events, when they come into market, it puts us on the map, not just for a great destination, great venues, it puts us in the game through it. But that last piece is the funding piece for us to get after it. Think of any NBA franchise, ours in town today, on how Alex Martins and his team are going after it today. It doesn't just start about writing a check. It just doesn't start with writing a check and getting the best free agents out there. It takes the right organization structure, it takes the right strategy, and it really takes the right players to get after it. And we <coughs> believe we have that plan to do that. So with that, it is about Team Central Florida. A lot of the players are in the room today. Every single one of them are literally in the room today. That sets the tone for what we do. So we appreciate the time and the opportunity to have you hear us today. So when we go back to Orange County and ask for that incremental 500K, it's going to drive that $400 million in incremental value to our destination. Thank you. Thank you, Biz. Um, Steve, Biz, stay right there. And then Kathy and who am I missing? Just, and Alan, why don't you guys come and sit on the front row so when commissioners ask questions, you're not walking from the hinterlands. Oh, and Phil, of course. Let me just tell you where we are real quick, and then I'll entertain commissioner questions or comments. Um, the tourism community was extremely supportive of Venues 1. Let's just call this one Venues 2 for our today's purposes. And likewise, they're very supportive of the package that passed out of the Tourist Development Council a couple of Fridays ago. And that package consisted of raising the debt ceiling or raising the ceiling under which we can access money in the first five cents, which currently has a cap of 270 million, to include $25 million for DPAC, $12 million for Florida or for the Citrus Bowl, and $20 million for soccer. And as Steve mentioned, um, in conjunction with the $12 million, additional $12 million in TDT, there would be $6 million as a match from Florida Citrus Sports for a total of $18 million. They also, the rest of the package includes $5 million a year over five years for Visit Orlando, which would come out of either reserves or excess TDT revenue. So it's not something that would be bonded against or loaned against. And then on top of the $5,500,000 a year over the next five years to the Central Florida Sports Commission, which I think is critically important if we're going to be able to attract events to um, our various venues that we're constructing or reconstructing. With that, um, I'm going to call on commissioners in order, and you can, if you would, address all of your questions related to various subjects to the appropriate people. Commissioner Lyon, and then Commissioner Stewart. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, um, our guests, for your presentations and our staff. Um, I'm not having a problem with where we are except um, in the back room. <laughs> for for instance, we had all these presentations. I know the Blueprint has been doing a great job, and I know this is part of generating jobs. I mean, that's what it's about with me. It's not only jobs for constructions, construction, but jobs for the uh, at the stadium or at the arena or at wherever it is. I like, Mayor, for us to look at our back of the house diversity. I mean, who's in the back room working every day, and what does that diversity look like? That's a real concern to me, because I haven't seen that much. I'm not impressed with that much uh, of people who come work 8 to 9, 8 to 10, whatever the hours are um, during the day, and when we have these presentations. I like to see some diversity coming forward to let me know who's working with you. Um, that's my first inquiry that I can ask someone uh, to at least give me um, some information, whether it's Byron or Kevin or whatever, um, on what these organizations look like when they go back to their offices. And is there diversity? Um, one of the uh, concerns I had, I know it's one of our agenda items, I noticed the architects on DPAC they dropped their uh, 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 participation from 31% down to 28%. Why do you drop it when you already had it uh, high? 
So those kind of things concern me. I believe the questions I've had uh, asked me about performing arts was just simply whether this performing arts center will be friendly to the community, period. Uh, people who are here, not the people who are going to come from far and abroad or whatever, but uh, what are we going to do, Kathy, to make sure that the people who live here, whose tax dollars, whose interests made this happen also, will have a voice and have a place and someone to contact to say, uh, you're welcome here. Actually, I, I, uh, I welcome the question. As you know, we went to uh, NJPAC together, and when you were in that facility with us, it looked like every walk of life was in that facility. We've designed the facility, so it's an invitation for everyone. But the programming, the content that actually is going to be in the facility, has to reach all the audiences. And we're starting that not only with education uh, initiatives, but also with just programming of performing arts organizations within the facility to reach those markets. Uh, we're already doing the test markets and test studies in terms of audience development and the need in terms of content and participation. That's one. So the diversity of audience is important to, to us as well. In terms of who's working at the Arts Center, um, I think that uh, it, it may seem that we have an enormous staff. Uh, we uh, have a very, very small staff, but we're growing. Right now, we're right around 78% with MWBE, uh, and we have a very strong uh, WBE, uh, just in terms of women uh, that are employed there, but also we're about 27, 28% just on more minority now. Now, we, we've not been hiring that aggressively. Between now and the time that we open, we actually are, and it is a targeted initiative. If we're going to be arts for every life, it's going to be across the board, not only people that work there, but also for audience development. Our program, our outreach and education is going to be targeted throughout the community as well for diverse markets. Who's doing that outreach, or have you not hired someone yet because you're not at that place yet? Well, uh, just in terms of who we hire? Well, I mean, our, the our facility isn't done, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether you're at that place to reach out to the community. Oh, we have not. We're just at the point, and we've just got our, uh, our senior team in place, our vice pres president of marketing. Um, is actually here today, um, Cindy Putnam, as well as our other facility operations. Cindy, she's here in the audience right now? She is. Who is that? Cindy? No, no, I just want to see what she looked like. Okay. Um, but across the board, as we hire, um, I can be happy to share that with you. Okay. It's every, every discipline will be hiring, philanthropy, uh, facility operations, technology, uh, marketing, um, et cetera. Right. I just like to see some diversity in whatever you're going to do there. So I, I very appreciate that a, a whole bunch. Um, then my next question or concern, I think I kind of understand that because we've been at it the longest. And it's not that I don't understand any of it, but I think the next piece uh, we all understand, of course, is the stadium. Um, so that I didn't have any questions on that, including the new um, the, the, the reconstruction, I think, uh, we've had talks on that almost ad nauseum. <laughs> Sorry, me, I don't mean to. <laughs> we just have. So <laughs> Steve is gone. No, no, he's still here. <laughs> I wasn't going to talk about you. <laughs> but I, I kind of get that. So that's not a question. I think we're going to do real good and everything. But Steve, I still need your help to help me around the, the, the stadium. You're the one who came to me and said, we need to do something. And we have been working with Walter and I really pushing that forward, and you were the one who stuck the pen in my hand to say, help. I need your help with the um, boxes, um, signalization boxes, and the uh, um, dumpster art. I mean, you've got rich friends, so just help the city out. We don't have any more money. We've given all our money away. So I need your help on that one. The other part is with the soccer stadium. Um, I thought that was a good presentation. I still like to look at the back of the house uh, diversity and then describe what that diversity is. Um, I do remember World Cup mirror in 1994, and one of the things we did at that time, and I think Walter Hawkins was managing that for the city years ago, um, how do we get to help the community, everybody engaged in it, move forward, and as you lift up one stadium or one area, that everybody, you know, comes up um, with it. 
the, around Paramore. We kind of go into Paramore. There's still some desolate uh, looking areas, and we really like to have your outreach there um, uh, to help us on that. And the same thing for you with the dumpster art, with the um, uh, what are you, signalization boxes. If you don't mind, if you get an appointment with me, we can talk about it as we do one thing. The whole community, and it's called Daisy Linum's Curve Appeal of the Block. It's like the HGTV, and you go in and you help. But Steve, I gave it a name. But everything within so many blocks start looking better, just looks uh, different and better if we can do that, including the jobs. People need jobs, whether they're homeless, whether they're ex-felons. And uh, you can't tell me ex-felons can't dig or can't do plant flowers or whatever else. Uh, and especially if you're moving through the blueprint. Um, I was impressed with that piece. But I really would like to talk with you about some other outreach for the community that everybody benefits. Um, and that way, they have fewer questions, fewer distrust opinions about what we're going to do. And I'm sure Kevin Edmonds just went crazy when you, somebody talked about lacrosse. Kevin, is your daughter still doing lacrosse? OK, well, here it goes. We're going to satisfy somebody here. But uh, Mayor, I uh, thought the presentation was uh, the presentations were fairly um, um, clear and cut. It says that the jobs it's about jobs, job opportunities. Who's going to build about the blueprint kicking in? And Mayor Dyer has been very, very um, consistent on that piece. But it's after the blueprint is done, after the construction is over, who's going to, who's going to have these jobs? And I think right now that's where my life is, and making sure we can get beyond construction get folks in jobs that are representative of the community and will have good jobs to ensure our trust and our diversity. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll move to Commissioner Stewart. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, let me say thank you to all of y'all who have been involved. Uh, you have carried the water uh, on this project, and, and uh, those of us who have been around for a few years have, have uh, admired your, your, um, your perseverance in this accomplishment. So thank you very much for that. I've got a couple of quick questions that, that um, um, I just, I'm just still un, uncomfortable with in terms of the answer. Um, so, um, Kathy, let me ask you specifically. Uh, um, you talked about the fact that our funding is at 92% of the project. Okay, so quickly that means we're about 80 million dollars behind. Is that right? No, about about 50 million dollars behind. We've got um, we've got 40 million to raise to complete the entire funding for the entire project. Okay, to that's 40 million outside of the 25 million from the, Correct. From the mayor. Correct. That's it. if we right if if we secure the 25 million dollars with Orange County, and we can raise the 40 million by the end of 2014, both that 25 and the additional 10 million from Dr. Phillips' charities would come to the project. That would complete the 100 percent funding. It would complete the 100 percent funding. <clears throat> okay, let me let me ask a different way, so I'll make sure I understand. Right. Um, we we don't have the 25 million that that Mayor Jacobs talked about a few months ago. This is the 25 million she talked about is bundled into this. That's the package, same. Correct? correct. That's the same 25 million. The same 25. Mm -hmm. okay. That's not an additional 25 million. Correct. Um, Although we'd be happy to have that additional 25 million. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you would. <laughs> um, so there's 40 million. Yeah, that, I share some of it with you guys yeah. together. <laughs> so there's 40 outside of that. There's 40 million dollars still there. Now what? The, there's a 10 million dollar matching grant from Dr. Phillips. Is that part of the 40 million? No, that's outside the four. We have the okay. philanthropy has 40 million. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, the nonprofit has 40 million dollars to secure. However, we can secure it, and wherever we can secure it, whether it's through additional public funding from outlying counties to uh, additional grants, federal, uh, statewide, or local, or through foundations, or through private and corporate gifts, or through sponsorship. Okay. I know on the agenda today that there's a, uh, an item that moves us ahead in terms of the, mm -hmm. uh, securing the drawings and, and making sure that the second phase goes ahead. Right. And I would assume that that's an amendment to our original agreement, because we want that to move forward, because we're are certain you're going to get the 40 million. When you're when you're eight percent away from 500 million, we are going to finish it. Okay. I mean, you look at our board of directors and what happened when we had to get the project started. You know, we're that close of not getting a project started, and within three weeks, securing two eight million dollars a letter of credit to get it started is short of miraculous. And we did it. 
and this board's not going to complete the, we're going to complete the project. Okay. We don't want to, you know, no matter what, we can get it done, but you don't want to open with debt. And the best thing we can do is push through the 40 million. We can begin construction less than 40 million because the requirement is that we have 100% of the funding for construction. Um, we have other uh, items that need to be funded in the building that are capitalized, but that doesn't, we don't have to have those done. Eventually we do to have an efficient building that can operate. Uh, and so if we can get to 25 million of the 45, we can start construction and continue our campaign to reach 40 million. The operating side, I understand that there's a $25 million set in escrow to cover any operating deficit. The thing that you and I have shared for several years is mm -hmm. I, my single greatest concern is the operating side. Right. It, 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 as difficult as it may seem to me to build a building, mm -hmm. it's easier to build a building than to keep it operationally sound for the next 50 to 60 years. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me a little bit about where we are in terms of that funding portion. That's, is that part wrapped up in the total amount of the gift, or is some that no. been set aside already? Well, it was, what's actually quite remarkable is we have close to six million dollars already committed to the endowment, between five and six million to the endowment. Um, it's very hard to raise endowment when you don't even have a building. I mean, candidly, mm -hmm. and most uh, endowment campaigns start after you've completed the building. Um, with our agreement with the city and the county, they wanted us to raise. Uh, endowment at the same time. Uh, again, since we're at six million, our requirement in our business model actually shows collecting off that endowment earnings five years after we open, and that's what um, we, it needs to be complete five years after we open. We're actually going to be earning monies once the building open off that endowment right in the very beginning. In addition to that 25 million of an endowment, we also have the commercial development, which is on the site, that was also impacted from 2008 although there's a potential to start earning revenue on that as soon as the, um, the office complex with CNL, as soon as that's triggered, as well as soon as the development of the hotel and the back property is done. That's projected in our, um, in our business model as well. Now, candidly, we were always going to be raising money for the Art Center, just like every hospital raises money every year, every university, the Burnham Institute. Um, we are just like those organizations. The more you raise, the more you do. We're mission-oriented. Our, bo our board knows that when they come on board, their job is to help raise money to further our, our institution in terms of its mission. And our board's guaranteed to raise $2 million annually. And candidly, that's a very, very conservative number in the state of Florida. Clearwater raises more money than $2 million a year for their art center, which is a very, very small art center. Okay, good. Th thank you very much, Kathy. And then the other question, uh, Alan. Um, there was a significant difference between the old uh, Amway Arena and the Amway Center in terms of the annual operating cost. That was one of the challenges that we've always had addressed. When we begin to look at the operating cost um, compared currently to the Citrus Bowl, to where the Citrus Bowl is going to be, um, where do we see that increase? And then how, how do you see us gathering more uh, events that would help us offset that operating cost. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, first off, there will be a slight increase in expenses uh, because of the condition space that we're going to, but we're also going to see some decrease in maintenance costs because obviously a 70-year-old uh, plus facility is uh, very expensive to keep up with maintenance and painting. So we're actually going to get some savings from that and doing that. Another thing, uh, adding the uh, synthetic uh, turf field has saved us money on both chemicals and uh, labor. So we've done some things in recent years that are going to help us uh, complete that. Uh, we are completing our negotiations with uh, Steve and Forrester Sports for a new agreement, uh, which will uh, render the uh, venue uh, revenue neutral, which means we should break even each year by this new contract. But working hand in hand with Steve and John and all of our partners, um, you know, we're going to go after these events, the, the neutral site games, obviously the international soccer that Phil mentioned, um, preseason games, concerts, all those things now we're going to be able to do and we've designed the facility so we can do that. We now have production back at house operations where before we didn't have that, people had to bring in trailers. So we've designed the locker rooms that could be, they can be converted into dressing rooms for a concert. So we have taken into consideration the future and how we're going to keep that uh, venue at a revenue neutral position. Yeah. I remember you telling me a long time ago the old Amway 
arena costs two hundred to four hundred thousand dollars a year for electricity, and the new Amway Center costs roughly a million dollars a year. We've gone from two hundred seventy-five thousand square feet to eight hundred seventy-five thousand square feet of air conditioned space. So when you begin to start adding those those things on the side and begin to put in some additional um, convention space on both sides that can be used. I am I'm, I'm have a concern we've got to make sure that we're, we're renting out more times than not to help offset that kind of annual cost. We've taken those in consideration and obviously we actually, you know, with uh, energy savings that we now have, you know, either through LED lighting and things like that and um, even the air conditioning control systems that we don't have now, now we have to go in and turn it off and if somebody leaves it on, we will have now structure and systems in place that will allow us to monitor that, those situations. So I think we're going to be in better shape. Uh, again, our square footage over there is actually about the same. So we know what we're going into. The uh, enclosed space that we're adding is about 10,000 on each uh, side. But the press box and the suites are all still there already. Uh, the press box that we're going to be renovating for future suites is the same size as far as square footage. So it should be negligible. We do expect some increase, obviously, uh, but we are budgeting for that and planning for that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Phil, real quickly, um, one of the things that um, uh, you and I have talked about is that when you start bringing in major games into here, um, you, you get a chance to use the Citrus Bowl. What what happens now? All of a sudden, when you you know we you you have a, a pristine facility for twenty two thousand, and you bring in uh, a Brazilian team or an All Star team or a playoff game, where you end up having to have forty five fifty thousand people that we have to accommodate, and you're and you're back onto a a synthetic turf field. Is that a big concern in, in that size? Um, let me clarify a couple of things, Commissioner. I, First of all, our playoff games, if we're in the MLS, we would play the playoff games at the soccer stadium. Oh, I understand. So, oh, yeah. so just the vast majority of the games would take place yeah. at that facility. Um, the games that would take place potentially in the Citrus Bowl would be a major international game. Uh, and that that varies, quite frankly. If it's a, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I'm looking at the breadth of uh, either, correct me if I'm wrong on this breadth, but I think. Under FIFA World Cup regulations, um, you've got to have a grass field in order to play on. Is that right? Like, yeah, yeah. You so depend upon the game, Commissioner. You may be able to get away with a synthetic field, or you may have to bring grass in. It will it will depend on who's actually playing and the the, the pushback those teams give you. If it's a World Cup qualifying game, I'm pretty, I think I'm pretty correct in saying it's got to be grass. Um, hence why you'd try and play that in the soccer stadium versus the Citrus Bowl. If it was an exhibition game where there's less at stake, uh, then you can get away with playing on a synthetic turf. You get the agreement of both teams, and you can play at the Citrus Bowl as it is today. Uh, so it would depend upon on the game and upon the conditions surrounding the game. Well, I, I see much much more of a partnership, frankly, between the soccer stadium and the Citrus Bowl yep. um, yes. than many yes. have portrayed to be in the media. Um, the idea is that, that they're, they will begin to feed off each other. There will be yes. smaller events that cost us too much money to do in the Citrus Bowl that may be best to do in the soccer because Correct. of the operation of the venue. And the soccer is likely to bring larger events yes. that need to have a larger venue that yep. comes into the community. So I mean, I see those as complementary one much more than, than most of the community does. And we do too. I think uh, Steve and I have had a great relationship since day one, and, and we talk about this quite frequently. I think it's it is a very very much a complementary relationship. The fact that we've got both facilities, there's things that would naturally be housed at the soccer stadium that today are just too small for the Citrus Bowl, quite frankly, and don't work properly in there. Likewise, we're gonna we're gonna bring and attract events that the Citrus Bowl and Florida Citrus Sports can benefit from. So. Like you, I see it as a mutually uh, beneficial win-win relationship. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Oh. Alan, yeah, that's a very good point I'll mention. Plus the city, of course, would be operating both venues. So you've got that consistency of operation as well. So uh, it, it does make for a very, very win-win situation. Yeah. And, and let me, um, uh, thank you very much, Phil. Let me kind of close with um, one of the things I think the mayor has done, in, in, which has been important to the city is to have us be the operation portion of these venues. Um, I know that we're getting investments from private. I know we're getting investments from, from others. 
but um, I think the long-term benefit to the community is that when we operate it, we have a chance to, uh, uh, to, to use it more for community benefit. We have a chance to use it uh, more for uh, an investment side. I, my vision is that if somebody were to come in and build it independently, what would happen on a regular basis is that we would get a phone call from somebody going, we want to bring in NCAA soccer. It's now owned by Orlando City Soccer. And city, would you give us $2 million to bring these guys in? Um, we, we don't want to be in that position as a city. We want to be in a position that we offer the venue, we offer the environment, and we let those, John, like you guys, take that lead in terms of attracting those into the community. So thank you very much. Thank you for what you all do, and thank you for uh, um, helping us look like the world-class city that we are. Mm -hmm. And Commissioner, that's exactly right. By us owning and operating, all the facilities are complementary and they don't compete with each other. Commissioner Gray. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll be quick given the time period. Um, just a couple of comments. First, Alan mentioned it. I just wanted to reinforce. I think it's important that, you don't have to get up, Alan. Take a break. There you go. Uh, that we continue. I've talked to Steve, talked to Alan, that we solidify our relationship with FCS. Um, we're, we're making a huge investment, as is FCS, by raising their own money. And I want to make sure that when we're done with our part, FCS is there for us and we'll continue to use their expertise to bring that in. So I know you're working on that. I just want to reinforce that. Um, as it relates to the soccer facility, I'm kind of looking at Rebecca at this stage. Um, I think Phil and his team have done a great job explaining the capital structure of this transaction, um, almost uh, to, the, to the point of Commissioner Stewart. Will we get a briefing on operational um, uh, costs and revenues as we get closer to making a decision? Maybe that's Alan. <laughs> Another part-time job is negotiating contracts with the Atlanta City Soccer folks. And again, that goal uh, the director of the mayor has given us is to go to revenue neutral for the year for that. So uh, we're negotiating how we share revenues and expenses and are in the process of getting to the end of that. But again, the direction is revenue neutral on the soccer stadium as well. Okay, thank you. And last, uh, John, uh, sent, uh, excuse my ignorance, I should know this probably, but as, as you look for funding from the city, what is our relationship with your organization? I mean, is it is it is there an agreement in place? Are there performance standards? Because my sense is over time there will be some conflicts in venues, and if you're receiving funding from several sources, how do you deal with those conflicts? I have Alan over my shoulder. So we uh, have six different agreements, but specifically with the city of Orlando, our agreement is basically we get after it, and we have performance metrics on basically how many events, incremental visitation from visitors, and uh, hotel room nights. Um, so they're different with each county, but specifically for uh, Orlando, it's basically a, a baseline funding that comes in and we renegotiate that or we get a letter each year to say, hey, what did you deliver? And we give a report card on what we delivered and then we go to renewal. It is basically the history. Okay, but and again, excuse my ignorance here. Will you be responsible for for marketing our venues, yes. or is it, okay? So, so, for instance, you you described, I think, in your presentation, a huge lacrosse meeting that is in the southwest that that we were able to secure through your efforts of your group. Yeah. Um, one of the stated purposes that we could use the soccer stadium for is lacrosse. Yeah. So, help me. How do we manage that conflict? Well, it's it's really not a conflict. That event that I referred to. Is, well, there's two events. One is a youth tournament that requires basically 15 to 18 fields. Now, if it needed a stadium for a finals, then you would look here. But in that event, there's not really a need okay. for a stadium. So in the NCAA bids, they all require stadiums of the, the new stadium that we're proposing here. So what we do is we look at each venue, the types of events, that could go into those venues, then target those events and get after it. So it's different by each venue, different by each market segment that we go after. Perfect. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Sheehan. And, and I'll be quick, too, Mayor. I, I'm very supportive of all these venues, um, you know, mainly funded by the tourist development tax. and want to go, certainly recognize the fact that the tourism industry has really stepped up and made an investment in our community. And again, this is from their tourist development tax. They're the one that should be able to say that we, they want to make these investments. And they're giving back, and we should definitely recognize that. Um, and soccer and lacrosse is played on grass. My nephews play both. And um, 
you know, they're, they are very, very different facilities. And if anybody remembers the Mud Bowl a few years ago at the Citrus Bowl, we had to play it on grass when the grass wasn't ready. That's why you have to play the two different sports on turf. So, again, it's just how it, how it is. Um, football is a different sport than lacrosse and soccer. I walk by Lake Highland Prep every day. It's very, very different if you're looking at those two sports. So um, building a soccer-specific stadium is important. And um, these are growing sports for, for our youth. I mean, um, we're looking at soccer fields out at Lake Druid Park that's in my district. These are growing, you know, sports, and they're very popular. And we want to make sure that we're, um, you know, doing the things that our community wants. And I think that youth soccer and youth lacrosse are definitely something that's very, that's a growing sport, and we need to, to go ahead and, and build those facilities. So that's all I had to say, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Thank each and every one of you because you guys have helped propose our city into what is known by the epicenter of the world. So thank you so much for that. Um, in terms of soccer, I was looking at a presentation paperwork I have here, economic impact study. What's the uh, overall economic impact we're going to be looking at uh, from soccer? <coughs> There's a number of pieces to that, Commissioner, but um, I think the easiest way to answer that is to go back to the, the CSNL report that was uh, that was commissioned last year uh, and we released in October, where the, the overall economic impact uh, that was projected there was $1.2 billion over a 30-year period. Uh, and that would come through a combination of things. That would be a combination of regular season games being played at the facility, the ability to, to attract and bring in other teams to play games, international games, for example, and also the opportunity to attract other sports into the venue as well. So the combination of all of those is that $1.2 billion over a 30-year period. Thank you, Mr. Rollins. I, I just have one more question, and this goes to Alan. Alan, why in the world, every time I look at that citrus ball, it always look orange and blue? <laughs> <laughs> why not black and gold? Something about my mayor's on a modern. Is that yeah. what it is? Mine's black Same thing with all well. the signage, Commissioner. Every time I look at the pictures of the Citrus Bowl, is orange and blue. Where's the gold? And so what's wrong with that? <laughs> we'll work. Thank you all very much. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for your presentations, and hopefully we'll be back here in a few weeks uh, for a final vote on the package. That concludes our workshop for today.